law firm based in the Pacific Northwest. Chris is the chair of the 70 Lawyer Project Liability Litigation Trust Group. Chris has litigated disputes in state and federal courts in the U.S. and before courts or administrative bodies in India, France, Greece, Cyprus, and Saudi Arabia. Chris currently serves on MSU's Honors College External Advisory Board and is active in the school's Mentor Mentee Program and helps teach a seminar offered once a year on constitutional law. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Chris. Thanks, Sydney. Uh, we are now finishing the fourth year of this presentation series, which is entitled After College, What's Next? Uh, throughout the series, and again today, we're gonna try to introduce you to various career paths that have been taken by our presenters who have led uh, successful careers in very diverse areas. Uh, it's gonna be very informal, no PowerPoint presentations, no videos. Uh, it's, it's meant to be more of a dialogue with you guys, the students in which you can ask questions after each one of the presentations, and I hope you really do, to try and see if the presenter's career paths are something of interest to you. We are going to ask the presenters to try and uh, discuss four topics, and they're the same ones that we've used throughout these presentations. The first being a summary of how they got from point A to point B, and what their careers have entailed. What are the rewards, what are the challenges, what are the enjoy enjoyments that they achieved through their careers? The second is going to be what kind of opportunities exist for you guys? What, what opportunities are out there for the students of today in careers that have been performed by our presenters over sometimes decades? And the third is, if you're interested in these particular areas, what can you do now as students to try and prepare yourself? Do you take some classes? Do you do some volunteer work? Do you try to get involved in internships over summers? All of these things are possibilities and our presenters will try to illuminate you on things you might wanna consider doing now to get ready for a uh, career paths at, like those selected. And the fourth point that our uh, presenters are gonna to touch on is Dr. Lee's question, which he has asked each one of the presenters to try and answer, which is there some nugget of wisdom, something that you have learned in your years in the workforce that you wish you had known when you were a student, student here at MSU. So each of us who were presenters have struggled with that somewhat, but we'll uh, again offer our insight today. Our three presenters are, have, are very diverse this time, which is fun. Uh, our first is gonna be Mark Kettering right here. Mark uh, is an entrepreneur and he is, uh, was a founder and the CEO of a very successful company in the Northwest called Bright Lights Consulting. Mark didn't take a straight path or direct path from college there, and, and it's something I think that reflects much of what you see in today's students, which is he came out of high school, he was a songwriter, a singer, and an entertainer, and a high school teacher. And from that, although he met his wife Wendy and during that uh, stint, he progressed to 30 years uh, and more in the technology fields holding management executive positions with companies that we all know like AT&T and Oracle. He then in 2004 uh, changed an idea into a business concept and formed Bright Light Consulting which provides analysis and data assimilation for leading companies in the Fortune 500 group uh, across the country and Mark's going to describe that uh, in more depth than, than I will now. <laughs> I think though that <clears throat> to me Mark is what many of us if not most of us aspire to be which is converting an idea and a concept into a business model and then taking that into a company and growing it and ultimately being able to transition the ownership of the company to others such that he and Wendy can build a farm on Puget Sound and retire there. Our second presenter is going to be Molly Lenz Molly's right here, and she, since for 20 years, has been a licensed marriage and family therapist. And now she has uh, achieved her, Mark got his undergraduate degree, by the way, uh, in speech, interpersonal communication from the University of Washington. Molly received her uh, degrees from the University of Washington and from Seattle Pacific University, a BA in speech as well, communication from the University of Washington and a master's in marriage and family counseling from Seattle Pacific. She took her education directly into uh, private uh, consulting and therapy with, with 
uh, professionals, with executives, professional athletes, children, and has worked together with healthcare providers to use her services and make them available to a wide range of different types of individuals. She has uh, experienced her work in an interesting time at the last year with COVID, both in the uh, therapy that she provides and in the problems that are encountered with her patients. And uh, Molly's agreed to share some of that experience with you. Our third presenter batting cleanup is Mark Roslowski here on my left. He is a scientist by training and uh, formerly was an executive and head of uh, research and development in the pharmaceutical industry, another industry which has gone through some amazing experiences and progress in the last year. He worked for Merck, both Merck and Bristol-Myers Squibb, and uh, examples of vaccines, like what we see from various companies these days that Mark helped, helped to develop was a vaccine that uh, prevents cervical cancer in women, it pre pre another one that prevents dehydration in children in certain circumstances, one that prevents uh, and deals with shingles, and another one that uh, affects and treats and prevents deep vein thrombosis. In doing this pioneering work that Mark did, he had to work with uh, world health leaders, uh, many of whom are the types of whom we see on television every night these days. Uh, and Mark also was the author of 12 or more peer-reviewed scientific papers. Uh, peer review is a very difficult and lengthy process that ensures the integrity of the papers written, and Mark was at the center of uh, 12 of them. In addition to his academic and uh, industry work, Mark, too, uh, contributes to this, this school by serving on the Honors Council uh, External Advisory Committee for the uh, Honors College. So I won't say anything more, but I want to turn the microphone over to our first presenter, Mr. Kettering. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. As uh, Bruce mentioned, uh, I was a graduate uh, in speech many years ago, but none of that training taught me to speak through a mask. <laughs> that was a new challenge. So I'll try to do my best. I hope you all can hear me. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys today. I, I really sincerely do because uh, many moons ago when I was in your position, uh, the opportunity to hear pragmatic stories about people who have finished their career or involved in their career when you guys are contemplating the beginnings of yours is a fantastic opportunity. So I'm, I'm honored to be here today. Um, so what I intend to do today is tell my story about my career and uh, hope that is insightful in some way. <laughs> Maybe it won't be. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, try to convey some of the wisdom of some of the things I picked up along the way that I wish I had known uh, when I was starting out. It might have saved me a little bit of embarrassment or some time. Or... So uh, I am a retired CEO. I am a 40-year uh, veteran slash mercenary of the computer high technology industry. And uh, I gra am a graduate of the University of Washington back in 1974. But I can tell you that at that time, when I graduated, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do with these 16 years of education that I had. Um, and I stumbled through five or six different majors uh, before I graduated. So uh, the good news is it all worked out. And uh, it wasn't because my career came up and tapped me on the shoulder and took me by the hand and walked me through my life. It was because of, of a, a little bit of luck, a lot of hard work. And uh, you know, it, it's just a matter of taking advantage of the opportunities that are presented to you, making a lot of mistakes and uh, having faith in the journey. So my encouragement to you guys is to, is to you know, give yourselves a break. This feels like a lot of pressure. I remember how much pressure and how uh, incompetent I felt looking at a whole world of working people and wondering how the hell am I going to be able to plug into all that. But it works out. It works out if you work hard, if you really want it. And uh, 
and a little bit of luck. But the old saying is, the harder you work, the luckier you get. So as I mentioned luck in the course of this talk, please read that to me, a lot of hard work. So um, I retired seven years ago after selling my company, uh, Bright Light Consulting, which is a company that I founded uh, in 2005. I founded it, wrote the business plan, funded the launch of the company with my wives and my own savings, and uh, really rolled the dice. Just decided that it was time for me to quit helping other entrepreneurs make their parachute happen and try to see if I could build something myself. So Bright Light Consulting was in a very specialized area of technology consulting, which uh, has come to be known as big data analytics. It's also called business intelligence. Uh, I was lucky to be in the very early days of that movement. And uh, I was lucky to be able to attract some of the brightest and best technical people in the industry to come work and take a chance on this very small company I had. And I would send these people, I would go out and meet the customer, understand their expectations, bring in these smart people, and they would delve into the company's corporate IT computers and pull together all of the vast volumes of information they had and organize that data in such a way that management could ask questions of the data. They could glean insight from data they had had for forever, but they weren't using in that way. They were just you know, logging transactions and storing data. But to take it and analyze it, you could learn about your customers. You could learn about your finances. You could learn about your marketing. You could learn about your competition. And uh, sure enough, it worked extremely well. It, to be able to query your own data to make what we call data-driven decisions about your company turned out to be a major global trend in the IT space. And uh, we were lucky enough to have some of the best consultants in that space. And thus, even though we were a 70-person company, we were being asked to go do work in the largest corporations in America, whether they were retail companies or pharmaceuticals or healthcare companies, insurance companies, almost every major industry space. So uh, when I talk about it being lucky to have attracted these consultants, um, it was really my job as CEO. They're the ones that did the hard work. But it was my job to set the vision for the company. It was my job to also build an environment in the company a culture in the company that made these people feel part of the mission, not just the company's mission and their employees. We worked really hard to create a positive, uplifting culture where these people would feel a part of what was going on. That was also a smart thing to do because those people were so talented. They were constantly, in the high-tech industry, like many others, recruiters are calling you weekly if you're good and they're trying to lure you out of the company into another company. So I had to have this culture so that those people would say, no, I'm part of a good thing. I feel connected to this organization. And I can't tell you how important that is. And it's something that uh, I didn't just read in a book. I discovered it because before Bright Light Consulting, I was part of 10 other high-tech organizations over 30 years. And in those, thir uh, in those 10 organizations, I worked for horrible managers. I worked for fantastic mentors. I worked for companies that had very odd business models. And I worked for companies that had an incredible uh, technological advancement that we took to market. So I, I learned through trial and error what worked and what didn't work. And I started out uh, working for the largest company in the world, AT&T, back in the 80s, as a sales rep. And then I went on to some other companies, worked for Oracle Corporation. I was a sales rep. I always thought I was just gonna be a sales guy. Never thought I wanted to manage. That was too much pressure. And sure enough, then I eventually got a sales manager job. And uh, 
started working in smaller companies, little startup software companies. The next thing I know, I was vice president of sales. And then I moved on to another company and I was vice president of sales and marketing. So this expanded responsibility gave me exposure to uh, less and less of just the customer relationship and the revenue generation side of the business and more to what makes the whole business model work. What's the, what's the balance sheet of the company look like? So I was able to take all of that across these 10 different hardware, software, and consulting companies I worked for. And uh, I was able to glean the best parts of that into the vision that I sat down uh, in 2005 and said, I'm, I'm tired of working for other people. And I was also 50 years old, so no one was calling me anymore. <laughs> so there's a thing called ageism. You're far from worrying about that, <laughs> but it might happen sooner or later. So I decided, okay, it was time for me to start my own company. And I took all those things and created Bright Light. After nine years of uh, momentum and growth, uh, we were finally approached by a much larger company who wanted to acquire us and uh, give my people uh, a significant new opportunity to grow in even different and larger global opportunities. So I did that and I sailed off into the sunset. So uh, that's really the core of what happened to me. But um, it wasn't like I sat there in college and said, I want to go into high tech. It did not happen that way. I got out of college, felt like I was burned out from 16 years of school, and I just needed a break. So I became a musician and uh, a singer-songwriter for four years, and uh, my parents weren't very happy with that. <laughs> but they were four of the happiest years of my life. Uh, I met my wife in the process. I, uh, I learned a lot about myself from performing every night in front of people. I met a lot of people. It really was recharging experience for me. So uh, then, once I decided to get married, I decided to get serious about looking for a job. And I had a lot of interviews. I did a lot of hustling around trying to figure out what was going to work. And AT&T came along and hired me. And in that process, they, uh, they gave me a year and a half of school teaching me about computers, teaching me about what solution selling really was, that it wasn't a slimy little way of convincing people. It was really attaching benefits and uh, values to a product and, a, and an offering. So uh, I, it was a very proud uh, profession for me, and I really enjoyed doing it. And uh, I would encourage anyone to consider it. But in terms of... Uh, just a few nuggets of what I may have learned. Just the best stuff. <laughs> um, one of the foundational cornerstones for me that I learned along the way that I would try to teach the people that worked for me is, uh, is to focus on two words. Manage clear expectations. Clear expectations. The, the way business works is people come together, they talk about what they need, another person talks about what they'll do, and then you go away. And sometimes it happens, and other times it doesn't happen. With clear expectations, you set out real strong parameters from the beginning of what you're gonna do for them, and when you're gonna do it, and what you expect them to do based on you doing that. And when that is clearly stated, and agreed upon up front, and then you execute that commitment, good things happen almost every time. The reason business doesn't tend to go well is because miscommunication, poorly set expectations, or a lack of commitment to execute on what you said you'd do. So uh, I really would challenge you in all of your interactions with people to think about that. When you tell someone you're going to do something, do it. It's essential. If you do it every time, that person you do it for is going to say, I can depend on him or her. I think I'll ask him to do something else. If you don't do it, your credibility sinks like a stone. And in the world of business, 
and relationships and trying to move your career forward. Those are the building blocks that really make it happen. Are you dependable? Do you deliver on what you say you will do? Those things are important. Another thing I would go back to from what I referred to before is pay attention to culture. There are so many organizations out there that have people who run them that are not well trained in management. And they will, they will bleed you dry. They will overwork you. They won't acknowledge you when you do well. They'll drain your character and you'll leave that organization exhausted. But if you do your homework up front, when you're interviewing, when you're thinking about joining an organization, if you research and find out what their values are, what they believe in, how they treat their people, you know, read stuff like glassdoor.com, read the reviews of people who have worked in an organization. Do they feel valued? Do they stay a long time? Or do they have a ton of turnover? These are important things for you to consider because I want to make sure you understand. <clears throat> Joining a company and interviewing for a job is a two-way street. You are interviewing the company as much as they're interviewing you. Now, that, you won't feel that way when you're coming right out of college, but the truth is you have as much right to know about them as they have a right to know about you. So that, that brings me to my last little tip, and it's a small tip, but it's especially important when you're young and starting your interviewing process. I used to interview a dozen people every week at Bright Light Consulting. And often, you know, young people right out of college. Um, <clears throat> ask questions. One of the worst things that people do when they come to an interview is they come in, they answer all the questions that are asked of them, and at the end, the interviewer says, do you have any questions? And the person says, no. That is a horrible answer. <laughs> when you have questions that you've thought out, the interviewer goes, this person cares, this person you know, looked into our organization, this person studied the job well enough that they have questions they want to ask. That will bode well for you. And at the early stage of your career, when you don't have a long resume of experience, it's those kinds of things that mean a lot. So uh, and just real quickly, what you can do now to prepare, my answer for that is uh, flesh out your academic experience with personal experience. Join a club. Join the chess club, the French club. Do other things that show the potential employer on your resume that it's not just about grade point and major. It's about the other things you do that show skills, Maybe you volunteer for a nonprofit that show values. These are the kind of things, because at, at the early stage in your career, they're making a bet on you on the limited information they can see. And grade point and major are only one small. They have to kind of fill in the gaps by what they see in the interview and the other things you do. So I would encourage you to try to flesh out things so that you, uh, so that you see, they can see more of who you are at the earliest possible opportunity. And I think that's about it for me. I think my time's up. Any questions I can answer? Mark, <coughs> at Bright Light, um, did you ever uh, <coughs> use student interns or well, <coughs> volunteers who are interested in the processes that you had developed? So if they wanted to sample the water of your company, you could um, do some sort of a summer job or the like? Yeah, yes, absolutely we did. And most high-tech organizations, uh, especially ones of a little size, they have extensive intern programs. And uh, of course, that's something, if you know that's an industry that you want to be part of, uh, that, that's an easy thing to do. Uh, uh, use your college even to uh, help you make some of those kind of connections because usually an organization will post it with a university and say, we're looking for someone this summer to come you know, work with us and do some things. So internships is an easy opportunity. <coughs> yes? What was the process of switching majors like for you? How did you know which one to switch? Like, did any end up being of any relevance for your future career? 
Well, um, they were all somewhat connected. I came to college wanting to be a drama major. So I did that for a year and a half, and then I was just too terrified, and I dropped out. And, uh, but then I went on to, uh, I was a classics major, so I studied Greek drama. <laughs> and then I, you know, so there was, it was sort of a process. One sort of led to the other. Uh, back when I was in school, changing majors was a piece of cake. And we were just talking at lunch today. That when I was in school, no one really thought about declaring a major until their junior year. So it, it you know, I, I actually feel for you guys that there's so much pressure to come in as a freshman and try to know what you want to do for the rest of your life. But uh, that, that's, I can't relate to that myself. But, uh, so no, it, it, it was an easy process, but it, it was kind of related. And even speech, um, coming from a drama background, going to speech, you know, I, I was involved in a, what they called Reader's Theater, which was an oral and turf kind of uh, organization. And it, uh, it did poetry readings and read famous speeches and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, th it was sort of a natural progression. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes? What did you find was most effective at building strong culture in your company? Um, you know, it, it had a lot to do with um, two-way communication. You know, so, so many times the traditional model of managing an organization is hierarchical. It, uh, you know, I'm the boss, you're the employee, be very scared when you are in front of me, and you know, let's not talk, unless you know, we really have to, and it's probably bad news. Uh, if you build a culture where your door is open and people can talk to you, uh, if you're out in your organization a lot, that helps break down some of those barriers. Um, it's also extremely important that you spend a lot of time acknowledging um, saying thank you, making people uh, understand that you're aware of their hard work. It's when people don't understand that you're working your guts out to get something done, and they're la-di-da doing their thing. But if they know, if they come over and put their, your hand on your shoulder and say, thank you for doing that, that helps. And the last thing I'd say is have a very strong and clear vision for the company. One that they can relate to, and then you express the vision in a way that you make them feel part of it. It's not the owner's vision, it's our vision. And once they feel part of that vision, they feel more connected and more invested. So I, I don't let me fool you, it's good for the company too to have people invested and feel excited about what you're trying to do in a company. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, based on your experience, what are your thoughts on the massive data collection analysis being done by companies today? Uh, what's my thought about massive data collection? Yeah. Basically. Are you asking that from a privacy perspective, or um, just just overall? Oh, I, I think it's absolutely essential. I think there have been uh, significant advancements, even in the seven years since I retired. Now that there's cloud computing, uh, the ability to store data at a low cost uh, and then to put it into the kind of format that you can query it and ask questions. You know, How many customers bought this product last spring versus the two springs before uh, you know, in these areas of the country bought <laughs> answer? Walk into a room with a report and then you get more done versus being in a meeting, someone saying, we want the answer to that question. Well, give me two weeks and I'll figure it out. So it, it's highly productive. Um, as Bill Gates would say, business is moving at the speed of light. And you need that kind of insight much faster and much more affordably in order to make all those fast changes. So uh, the cost of computing has gone down. The accessibility to the data is, is much better. And I think it serves organizations tremendously. Yes? What is the downfall of the tech industry that you would say is the biggest? What's the downfall of the uh, high-tech industry? Yeah. Well, uh, it might sound a little bit like I'm being redundant, but um, 
a lot of technical people with strong technical backgrounds ha easily get success in that industry and they get a lot of money. And what do they do? They go out and start a company. And that company is run by a person with no management experience. I experienced this three or four times in my career that an incredibly smart PhD with a ton of money started a company but treated people like garbage. Yelled and screamed and stomped. So I, I think that has notoriously been one of the gates in the industry that it, without culture, it burns people out. It drives people out. Uh, and I think that it makes a big difference. And there were, in the 90s especially, when Microsoft was fitting out millionaires by the dozens and dozens, many of those people went out and started companies and just burned people out. Many of those companies didn't succeed. And they could have and should have. But they didn't have good managers. They didn't have good uh, culture. So that's, that's a downfall. Thank you. Yes? So like as a STEM student myself, like I kind of understand that, but I feel like I don't get a lot of experience like learning how to interact with people and I kind of just like sit doing math all day by myself. Yeah. So how would you recommend like gaining that experience? Well, um, first of all, I'd say, depending on the kind of role you want, you don't have to be a gregarious, you know, you know, person, b best personality in school. It's not a requirement. Most really great programmers are very nerdly, very, <laughs> <laughs> very uh, shy, and that's okay. It really is okay. It, it's expected. So I'm not saying don't. I'm not saying don't try to get experience and learn how to be a better communicator. Uh, you know, there are things like Toastmasters, there are organizations you can uh, join that will help uh, bring out your ability to articulate. There's lots of opportunities to do that. And I would encourage that, but it, it, it's also okay if you're deeply technical and you're an amazing programmer, amazing math, maybe a data scientist, um, uh, there's lots of opportunity in that way too. But you know, there's crossover points. Like if you became a certified data scientist, that involves a lot of analysis in front of customers. So you do need to be able to ask good questions, relate to people. So you know, it, many times your path is a result of your personality. And uh, there's always growth opportunity, but don't feel like you have to do that in order to succeed. Does that make sense? Okay. Is that it? All right. Thank you very much. Well, I am not tech savvy. <laughs> My little piece of paper here. So I was um, thrilled to know that there was no PowerPoint or no um, technology with my presentation. So, uh, my name is Molly, and I am a, you know, like I said, licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, I went straight from undergraduate to graduate school. Uh, part of the reason I did choose to apply to graduate school is I really didn't know what I wanted to do, and I thought if I got in, this is this is the path I think I would like, and I got in, and so fortunate enough to get into a program that at the end of it um, felt like I learned a lot about myself and independently if from going into the field or not, I felt like I, I gained some really amazing skills. I ended up really loving my program um, and was fortunate enough to go straight from graduate school into a private practice. Um, and I've been in private practice for about 20 years. I've worked in a lot of different areas. Uh, I worked in hospital, a lot of healthcare, developing programs for within hospitals. I've also um, worked in a lot of education systems, um, from elementary to, you know, developing programs for health and uh, fitness, different kind of education programs as well. Um, and now my job is a little bit like maybe I'm dating myself. Um, if you've seen the show Billions. You guys know what that show is? About five years old. Wendy on Billions is an in-house psychiatrist who is a performance coach, and she really helps the executives, sort of what Mark was talking about, people that can't communicate, have difficulty communicate, have difficulty with relationships. I get to work with those sorts of people and help 
with creating culture as an outsider sort of consultant. So um, I've been doing a lot more, I think what Bruce was saying during COVID, being able to do telehealth, um, a lot more people have access to me and I have access to companies. Um, I do work with some professional athletes, people that play in European leagues, et cetera. You know, I can make a, a call to London and you know, I have access and they have access to me, which has been really fun. So I've had a really diverse, what I love about my job is I get to work with lots of different people and hear lots of different stories. So each day, you know, there's a variety of, of different areas and I like, um, I like being able to hear different stories and work with, you know, just new and different situations and learning, you know, learning different areas as I've gone along. Um, how do you, how do you get experience in this field? A lot of, a lot of the jobs needed in the mental health field, not all of them, you do need to have a bachelor's and most of them you need to have a higher education, a master's. It's really confusing in the mental health field. People will call, call me doctor, not doctor. Um, there's master's level and in the master's level there's specific trainings in mental health. So you'll hear social work. I'm a master's in marriage and family therapy. There's a master's in counseling, master's of social work. Those each have specific training in them that is something I wish I had learned a little bit more about because if you want to work in a hospital, social workers are kind of like more highly regarded um, to be able to work in a hospital setting if that's what you wanted to do, case management, you know, work in a cancer clinic, et cetera. Um, and there are also programs that have dual for masters of counseling in, to be like in private practice and clinically counsel as well as be a school counselor. So that's the master's level. The next level is PhD more researchers, professors, do a lot of neuro, neuropsych testing, et cetera, and then psychiatry. So people get confused with that, and those are the three different levels. And then the other area in my field is IO. Have any of you heard of that? Organizational psychology. So that wasn't around when I was training. I probably would have explored some of that more. That's um, industrial organizational psychology. And you know, do research for companies. They're the people that help with culture and companies giving resources to the team in these in these bigger organizations and a lot of it is um, in HR so that's another area that you can go into kind of a side a side door um, kind of from from mental health there's also um, another area that's come out of marriage and family therapy called medical family therapy um, I, although I'm not certified in that, I work with a lot of people with complex medical diagnoses. So if someone gets a cancer diagnosis, um, I work with a lot of, um, you know, college students, professional athletes that get, get diagnosed with ADHD. How, what kind of services can you get? What kind of accommodations can you get? What are good jobs to be placed with the, the gift of what I call ADHD? or a medical diagnosis, medical family therapy helps someone, you have a long-term diagnosis like ASL, how does that impact a family? What kind of resources are there? Um, how does that change a family system? And, and how do you help support that whole system? And oftentimes it's the caregiver that I'm, you know, that I'm working with. And then I work in conjunction with a lot of, um, a lot of physicians in, in the area and so, collaborating, I work very holistically in helping look at um, the problem from a lot of different a lot of different areas. How do you prepare to go into this field? You know, what is really nice is you don't have to have a degree to work in a lot of organizations. Um, I'm sure on campus here you have student services, you can volunteer, but actually a lot of them will hire um, youth agencies if you want to work in a hospital go get an internship or work in that hospital setting. And there are also like crisis lines. Um, you can volunteer for that. You can actually get free training. You also can go to trainings. So there's a lot of continuing um, education in the mental health field. So if you're interested in neuroscience, um, go to a training in that and see if that's something that excites you. One of, um, I thought I wanted to go into education and in college um, we, there was a class where you actually went and worked in classrooms as a part of getting credit for, I don't know, some fulfillment that I needed to get. 
And it was actually going into the classroom that I was placed with students. It was elementary school. I was placed with students with just needed one-on-one -on -one help. And I went, I don't want to teach. That job, oh my gosh, that job was way, <laughs> there's a lot going on there. But I really wanted to do the one-on-one -on -one work. And it was because I had that experience of going into a live classroom, seeing what a live cl classroom was like, that really made me change my mind and not, you know, not go that route. Um, so have experiences in lots of different areas where you see live people. The other thing to kind of pay attention to is the people that are working at that office, are they happy? Or do they like what they do? Is there a high burnout rate? There's a high burnout rate in my field. Why is there a high burnout rate? Um, do these people have a work-life balance? You know, looking at some of those, those different things are really, really important. Um, and especially in going into a field where there's a lot of specialty, you know, go, go test out the waters. And I think sometimes what I've learned in my career are the things that I don't like or I'm not good at actually lead me to what I've loved the most. So if you're in an area and you go, you know, like I said, when I was in the elementary school and I went, oh my gosh, this is, this is not for me, I probably would have gotten my master's in education not knowing that. Um, and I'm sure I would have switched careers or maybe wouldn't have made it in that. So, <laughs> um, you know, I thought a lot about this question of what I wish I had known in college. One of my favorite age groups to work in is actually college students or people entering college because I have such a passion for helping people find who they are because I think when you're really solid of who you are you then can be more discerning about what you want to do um, you know I did not know who I was at what 21 22 but I think the clearer you can get about what you love what's important to you what your passions are you can manifest that and create that, whether it's your job or continuing doing a hobby that fulfills you. Um, I'm, I'm lucky, I really, really love what I do. Um, not many people get to say that. We had a conversation at our dinner table, if you won the lottery, Bob, mm -hmm. you won $6 million, would you keep working? And I said, I actually, I actually would. And um, there's been times I've burned out, there's been times that I, um, haven't always loved it. I hate doing my taxes. I hate technology sometimes. <laughs> I don't like QuickBooks. Those are the things that I really don't like and every job has parts of it you don't like. But when you're, when you're exploring whatever your field you're in, look at the people. Look at their lifestyle. Look at are they happy and ask questions. I was recently working with um, a person I work with that is a CEO and he said you know one of the things I really wish people would do would be incessantly curious and I thought that was a really interesting thing as he's interviewing people young people now he said keep being curious keep exploring different options learn from your mistakes and um, you know don't be afraid to admit you made a mistake um, I think that's you know being humble asking questions Every job that I created in my own practice did not exist until I stepped into it. So, meaning there wasn't a job waiting for me. When I went to private practice, I had to go door to door and literally be like, hi, I'm Molly, I'm 23, Hi. and you're a physician, and you have patients, and this is what I do. I brought lunch. I went into a school. I loved education. I knew I still wanted to work in education pitched myself to a school and said, you don't have a counselor, how would you like to hire me? And they said, oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. And, and I stayed there for 17 years and I did a lot of different things and um, learned a lot you know, from, from doing that. And so don't be afraid if something doesn't exist, um, make it happen. I mean, go, go find out ways that it can. And I think if, even if you're working for a big company, if there's a hole, there's a gap, Think about what you can do to improve you know the company or the situation I think the other thing I wish I knew is didn't ask you know what do you get paid in this field 
Um, you know, I think a lot of people go, oh, I really want to do something that's giving back, and then they pay for all this money for social work, and they find out they get paid less in the future. That's a problem, right? If, you're, if, you're, if you have a lot, I mean, college and education is so expensive. So one of the things you know, that you might consider is working for a company that has a really great program that helps to pay for, for education. I know Starbucks has an awesome, you know, training programs, but they really, really promote um, helping young people if they want to get, you know, master's level or on. And so that could be also a way of, you know, getting the education and also understanding, um, you know, what what a typical in income is out of this career and um, what kind of lifestyle it would provide. Um, and the other is to have fun. I mean, really, like if you wanted to go be a ski bum for a year, well, I guess you guys already kind of get to do that here. That's why, <laughs> that's why you know, I guess that's part of being at uh, Montana State right now. Um, but if you wanted to go travel the world, if you want to go do something that you've always wanted to do, go do it. Take a year off or find a job that you get to have that experience. If it's travel, seeing the world, um, you know, I, I think that those are, you won't regret um, kind of following your passion. And down the line, you can figure out too, I know one of the things for me considering a career was I knew I wanted to have a family, God willing, and so I wanted to have something um, that, that was important to me that had some flexibility. And so part of the private practice, having my own business has allowed me uh, to continue to work. And um, I guess you have to ask my kids somewhat be um, balanced in being a parent and, and doing what I do. So I think that's it. Um, any questions? Um, going back, would you change the master's decision? Like, would you do a master's or a PhD? Did you face any limitations, um, and why or why not? Either way. And then, second question is, um, people come to a therapist to unload their problems. Mm -hmm. So, do you carry the weight of other people's problems, or how do you kind of combat that? Yeah, those are great questions. I knew I didn't want to get a PhD um, because I didn't think the investment of getting of going to continue graduate school was worth actually the income I was going to make in the field and I am terrible at math and I did not want to do I did my one stats class and that was it and my one math class in college so I knew I didn't want to do research and the the bonus of beginning your PhD is either to be a neuroscience I mean to do neuropsych testing or to be a professor and I didn't want to do either of those um, great question uh, very high burnout field Self-care, I mean, I think having hobbies, having interests, setting boundaries about how much work I do and what kind of cases I take. Um, the beginning of my, car my career, I did not do as good of a job as I do now. Uh, I think that's something that comes with uh, wisdom and experience. But, you know, I do yoga, I have to do my own meditation, I have to often practice what I preach when I'm working with people. Um, and there's just times where there's really tough stories and situations that as, as many boundaries as you said, it is hard. It is challenging. But most of the time, I really love it. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Molly, what have you noticed in, uh, in patients who are kids or, or others that are COVID times, what, what traits and problems have, have arisen that didn't exist before our social distancing and limitations on schools and the like? Yeah, in Washington, we've been online. The public schools have not gone back live at all. So it's been really interesting. There's been a high um, increase of anxiety and depression. It's very hard to get services. Um, people are booked out. It's probably the busiest I've ever been in my career. Um, and on the other hand, some people that are more introverted and maybe have some social anxiety are actually doing better because there sometimes is a lot of pressure, um, you know, with jobs, et cetera. So I've seen it kind of go all the way around. I've had um, also people come in because they've been isolated for so long and they are, they're living alone, they're a widow, they literally have not seen anybody, they're a coder, and, you know, they haven't, they haven't, or, you know, in data technology and haven't left their house. So they end up in the emergency room with a panic attack. So, um, you know, there's, there's that kind of wide range. Um, I, I find that people are more willing um, 
to reach out because it's a lot easier with telehealth. Um, and some people that don't want to come in because they want to be live. Mm -hmm. So it's been the first time in my life that I can do my job from wherever, which is very exciting. So I've been able to travel for the first time and work, which um, that's been a nice work-life balance for sure. Any, Any other questions? I think there's nothing like um, live. You can see things better. You actually experience uh, people differently. The most challenge I've had is doing any kind of family therapy or group therapy or couples because you just can't see everything in the same way. So although I'm providing the service, sometimes I feel like it, it, it's just a little bit harder. And sometimes I feel a little more exhausted after doing like a telehealth session. I think it's easier to get distracted on both sides. Um, you know, with technology, things will ring and pop up and, you know, and, and, and all of a sudden you're on a, you know, something glitches and you, someone has just shared information and it's, the screen goes down and they can't hear you. So that just feels awkward, especially if it's disclosing something really emotional. And you're like, oh, sorry, can you say that again? You know, it's like, mm, that's, that's hard. Any other questions? Thanks, Molly. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. Actually, thanks, Mark and Molly, because um, some of the things that you said really resonated with me, especially the culture and um, the environment that you work in. That's so important because if the culture isn't isn't um, adequate or inappropriate, then you're not going to be happy. So um, a couple of weeks ago, the th four of us met uh, to discuss uh, by telecon uh, how we were going to, um, to do this presentation. And, you know, Bruce said, well, we should uh, start from, you know, where you are today and work your way backwards. And I was thinking, gee, I'm a big guy, and I'm not sure the kids want to hear how well the skiing is. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so the last 10 years before I retired, uh, five years ago, I worked at Bristol Myers Squibb and I was in charge of regulatory CMC. And so you'd say, what, what does CMC stand for? So CMC is chemistry, manufacturing, and control. So what that is, is it's how the product was developed, manufactured, and tested. So when you've heard about vaccines and license applications over the last year or so uh, for, for, uh, because of coronavirus, so when, when um, a company files a license application, there are mainly like three sections. One is obviously the clinical data, right? And then there's also toxicology data, so any animal studies that had been done. But the third section is the CMC sh section which I was in charge of when I worked at Bristol Myers Squibb. And that is, as I mentioned, you know, how the product was developed, tested, and controlled, because you want to make sure that you consistently can deliver that product from batch to batch to batch. So at Bristol Myers Squibb, we had two types of products, um, your pills or tablets, so that was really chemistry products, and then biologics. So an example of the, uh, the pills or the uh, chemistry products was Eliquis, which he's probably seen more than enough commercials for. Uh, but the biologics, they are actually uh, designed by molecular biology, and they're grown in cells, and they're antibodies or antigens or subunit antigens. So what they're manufactured completely differently, and they're actually regulated differently than your chemistry products or your tablets. So 
I enjoyed working on the two variety of products and the way the department was structured at BMS is that there was only one department that handled CMC for the globe, which was great because a lot of companies had a regional CMC departments. So when you, when you have one department, you can kind of, you don't have the bureaucracy of uh, having multiple people doing multiple things or different things. And so you can organize it differently than if you had multiple departments. Um, so I had done that for 10 years, but what was interesting was that there are other responsibilities related to uh, regulatory CMC that enabled me to do a lot more and also enabled the staff to do a lot more. So BMS worked on innovative products, which means that they're first in class. So they're not products that were generics that someone else had developed. These were products that BMS developed and they were first in class or no one else had developed them before or other people were developing similar products at the same time. But health authorities did not have experience with these products. So what was great was that, you know, you're on the cutting edge of science and you had to describe to health authorities globally, the FDA in Europe, in Japan, all over the world, uh, what this product does and how you could control and manufacture it. So that was exciting because uh, you were sharing products that were in some cases life-saving. Uh, for example, at BMS, Updevo is one of the oncology products that had a really novel mechanism of action where um, it was an immunotherapy which turned the, the tumor cell turns off your immune system. Updevo took that break off so that your own immune system could fight the cancer. So that was really r radical and novel mechanism of action. So dealing with health authorities, dealing with these types of novel products was really exciting. Now, it was challenging because uh, especially when you're dealing with health authorities at all over the, you know, 25 different health authorities around the globe that you had to deal with. And the European Union just being one, even though there were 27 members in that country. So uh, trying to co convince or uh, persuade health authorities that this product should be licensed was challenging, especially for a product that they had no experience with. Um, so, so that was, that was uh, interesting and, and exciting. The other thing was dealing with uh, different uh, pharmaceutical consortiums at conferences, scientific conferences that I would go to. You would deal with other folks within the industry and different regulators and also working together to harmonize guidelines so that you you try to have standards that applied across the globe. And so one thing was working on a guideline for inter, uh, on this International Conference of Harmonization, uh, which is um, an organization which tries to harmonize regulations, not only for CMC, but for clinical regulations and safety regulations and efficacy regulations across the globe. So. Um, it gave you exposure to different cultures and you really found out that we're all more alike than dissimilar uh, when, when you're dealing with people from different cultures. Uh, so that was my experience at BMS. So I, I came to BMS from Merck and I actually, when I first started, I never, I guess, I guess like with Mark, although my path wasn't as circuitous as yours, but I always wanted to be a scientist. I, I never thought I'd end up in regulatory. So when I joined BM, uh, when I joined Merck, I was working in, in the lab doing experiments and lab experiments and research 
more applied research. Uh, and then eventually what ends up happening is that your career path is really a series of decisions. So there is opportunities that arise. And then you'll, for me anyway, I made decisions to say, okay, well that seems like a good thing to do. Uh, and I would do it. And when you're in a big company, there are more opportunities to do things like that. If you're in a smaller company, a biotech startup, for example, you tend to get more pigeonholed and, and tend to do the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. There are more opportunities in bigger companies to move around and actually they encourage you to move around. If, if you show that you're a hard worker, so you make your own opportunities um, because they want someone who knows the business uh, and not just a little niche of your experiments. Now, if that's what you want to do, that's fine and you can be successful. But if you get tired of doing the same thing over and over again, in a big company there are opportunities to move around into different departments and different, actually, divisions of a department. And that's what I did at Merck. So I started off in MRL, which was the research labs, and I ended up in MMD. And that opened up so many different doors, Merck Manufacturing Division, that opened up so many doors uh, for my career advancement. And if I had stayed in, in the research labs, it, my advancement would have been limited. So um, how did I get to Merck? So I had done a lot of basic research. And quite frankly, I thought I was going to be an academic research scientist. So I had always been interested in science and doing experiments. And so I went to college, bachelor's of science, graduate school, got my PhD in uh, cardiovascular physiology, and then ended up going to UT Southwestern Medical Center to do more research on cardiovascular disease. So what ended up happening was I thought, I was looking at my, uh, my lab advisor and other people there, and it was, this was in the late 80s, and there was a lot of pressure on, and probably still is, on getting funding and grants from, from the, the health authority, from the FDA. So, uh, and a lot of the research was basic research, so answering fundamental questions. And after a time, I said, well, I want to do applied research. I want to solve problems. For example, let's make a vaccine against coronavirus, right? So that's why I decided to go into industry. And uh, some, some things or learnings that I had during the course of my adventure was that um, at each step of the way, there were people who would say, Oh, I wouldn't do that, <laughs> right? So wh when I was in, uh, when I was at UT Southwestern, or even before I went there, because I had studied on the East Coast, and people, well, why are you going to Dallas? I wouldn't go to Dallas. All the good research is on the East Coast, like in the Boston area and New Jersey, and, and it, so I wouldn't go to Dallas. And it's like, well, actually, I wanted to go to Dallas because I had grown up on the East Coast. And I wanted a different experience, a different life experience. So I moved to Dallas, Texas. And if you know anything about UT Southwestern Medical Center, it's a high-powered research center. So when I was there, I was happy. But after five or six years, I said, you know, I want something more than basic research. I want applied research. So I joined Merck. People at UT Southwestern said, real scientists stay in academia. <laughs> Real scientists don't go to industry, right? So, so I went to, so I said, okay, I went to, to Merck. And even before I went to Merck, there were two opportunities. One was a small startup in La Jolla and then Merck on the East Coast. And I was trying to weigh my options to say, well, what did I want? I mean, my interview in the La Jolla Biotech was, let's go on a 50-mile bike trip. 
That was the interview, <laughs> right? Because so. <laughs> they knew that, and, you know, La Jolla is gorgeous, gorgeous. right? So, uh, but what did I want at the time? And what I wanted was, I had just gotten married. We wanted to spend some time, like 10 years at a place and raise a family. It was like, okay, could I do that in La Jolla with a company that was a startup? And we decided no. So took the job at Merck and stayed there for 15 years. So when I was in MRL, the research labs, and when I wanted to go to MMD, why are you going to MMD? You know, real researchers at, you know, in Merck go to, you know, stay in MRL, and they do research, and they don't go to MMD. And it's funny because um, Merck was where Maurice Hilleman worked, right? You probably all know Maurice. And I was in the department he started, but when I re read books about him, he hated MMD too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, so, so I went to, to MMD, and that's how I got into it. Uh, I was working on vaccines in MMD, and I had this similar positions in doing regulatory science and CMC for vaccines at Merck before I went to BMS. And the reason I went to BMS was that, and this gets back to Mark's comment about culture, um, my boss at the time, um, I had approached her and I had said, you know, we had just gotten four vaccines approved within 18 months. The Gardasil vaccine, Rotatec, Shingles, Zoster vaccine, and ProQuad, which is MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella. And I looked back in the pipeline, in the vaccine pipeline, and I said, you know, there's not much in that pipeline <laughs> coming down the road. And the head, my counterpart in the small molecule world at Merck was retiring. And I said to my boss, you know, I'd like to take his job and learn something new. It's small molecules. I've always worked on vaccines in my 15 years at Merck. And she said, you know, we like you where you are. And um, so, no. And I said, okay. So at BMS, in, in big pharma, people move around to different companies. And some people had left Merck to go to BMS. And they said, you know, Mark, we're starting up biologics at BMS. Do you want to come there? And I said, well, you know, I've only worked on vaccines. It's not the same thing as biologics. And they said, it doesn't matter. We know you. If you can work on vaccines, you can work on anything. <laughs> so, um, so that's why I left. So, you know, it gets back to the culture and giving people opportunities. If they show that they're good, if they show they work hard, if they deliver on their promises, as Mark had mentioned, opportunities will be there for you. Right. So in terms of, you know, what to do to prepare yourself, you know, clearly over the last year or so, science is, has been on the front page every single day because of the pandemic. So I think you can always, if you're interested in doing research, you can find a company, whether it's small or large, depending on what you want to do, to get research done. I would start doing research in labs here, in the university, right? Um, and then in terms of regulatory, I think there are societies that right now you can Google their websites. So there's RAPS, Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. There's CAS, which is California uh, Solution Separation Society. They put on conferences all the time, and you can